And um, Hebrews chapter 4, end of chapter 4. In some books you have a title, Jesus the Great High Priest. That's basically what I'm talking about today. Jesus our Great High Priest. Therefore, since we have a great High Priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens. Just ponder on that for a minute. Gone through the heavens. You remember when the disciples were with Jesus for his last, very last days on earth in his, with his resurrected body after he died, rose again. And in his resurrected body, he was with the disciples. Remember, he was with them. He spoke to them. He said, go out into all the world, preach the gospel. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey me. Everything that I have commanded you, and lo, I will be with you until the very end of the age. And then just starts lifting up. Can you imagine? He just started his body. Started lift, going up in bodily form, up into heaven in front of the disciples' eyes. It's pretty amazing, isn't it, to think about that? So he went up into heaven with the scars in his arms and his side and his legs and his feet, sorry. He went up into heaven. So he literally went up. It says here, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens. Okay, just hold that thought of him going up into heaven, into heaven. But what did he come with? Every high priest had to come. in When, when we're talking about all the high priests from, from before the time of Jesus, the high priests who descended from Aaron in the tribe of Levi, they would, to come into the temple, they had to bring an offering. A sacrifice, first of all, for their own sins, to, uh, don't want to use wrong words, but to be a propitiation for their sins, an atonement, something to uh, make up for, if you like, their sins, uh, to nullify their sins. They had to bring, the, uh, they'd slaughtered an animal, and the blood of that animal, they'd bring it to God. Don't ask me exactly why that's what God wanted, but that is what he wanted. And it says in Hebrews that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness. So there's something in there. And I think it's a representation. I think it's all about pointing to Jesus. All this blood of the goats, blood of the bulls. Why is all this going on? Well, actually, it was all to point out that none of it was enough. None of it was good enough. It didn't work. It only for a time brought, uh, the, the high priest had to kind of confess all his sins and, and, uh, and bring the blood of a goat and a bull for, for himself and for all the people. And then once a year only, he could go into the most holy place in the temple where the, the God said to God actually resided. He was there in that holy of holies. So why the priest, God is holy. Right. God is holy. That means he's perfect. He's holy. He's without sin, no sin. And he cannot have any contact with sin at all. So how us human beings sinful, we all know we're sinful, right? <laughs> if, we're really, if we're honest, we know we're sinful. We know we get things wrong, maybe not on purpose, maybe on purpose. But every day we think things that aren't good. We say things. We, and, and I don't know about you, but I struggle with that quite a bit at the time because <laughs> I haven't fully understood how God's done everything to make me right with him. And I still feel bad about it sometimes. I'm still trying to work my own salvation. But God has done it. Now, he had to do it because if he wants to have relationship with us, he's holy. He can't have any contact with us. But, oh, but I created them for relationship with me. But I can't. 
So he needs. So in the old days, they had to bring all this, the blood of the sacrifice. This what a process! All those priests had to go through, killing all these bulls and goats, and then they could come. And then one day a year, the high priest, only the great high priest, could come into the um, holy of holies on behalf of all the people and be in the presence of God. That isn't a good much of a relationship with him is it if that can only happen once a year and it's only the high priest but god didn't want god wanted us more than that for us why did he why did it all work like that for so long he was trying to show us over centuries humankind you can't do it on your own i've given you the law to show you that you can't do the law anyone who fails just one bit of the law is under a curse jesus came to redeem us from that curse. we It's all pointing towards Jesus, the Old Testament. Everything you read in there is basically saying, and finally, the, Israel, the, the people of Israel realised that, the Jews, and they were crying out for centuries, centuries, we need a saviour, we need a saviour. Help us, Lord. They kind of finally got the message. Having done everything that they could, the priests done what they could, um, Got, having been taken into exile because they really didn't uh, weren't doing the right thing, and then back back again. Welcome, Nathan. Um, and they finally started crying out for God. Now this is about Jesus, our High Priest. Now I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter uh, end of chapter six, which isn't even in my remit, but I just felt this is what <laughs> this is where I'm going to go from. Um, in the, so this talking about the oath. Indeed, men uh, swear, uh, this is about giving the promises uh, to Abraham. And so having waited patiently, Abraham realized the promise in the miraculous birth of Isaac as a pledge of what was to come from God. Indeed, men swear an oath by one greater than themselves, me off. Men swear an oath by one greater than themselves, and with them in all disputes, the oath serves as confirmation of what has been said and is an end of the dispute. In the same way, God, in his desire to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable nature of his purpose intervened and guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, which are God's word and God's oath, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to him for refuge. Listen to that. We who have fled to him for refuge would have strong encouragement and indwelling strength to hold tightly, tightly, hold tightly, just hold on to it, hold tightly to the hope set before us. We would have, as we have fled to him, for refuge, we would have strong encouragement and indwelling strength to hold tightly to the hope set before us. This hope, this confident assurance we have as an anchor of the soul. I'm going to carry on, but what is this hope? What is this hope? Yeah? Jesus. Jesus. And what he's done for us. Jesus. Now, Jesus goes into the... Well, no, let's start one thing at a time. Jesus goes onto the cross. He dies on the cross. He sheds his blood for our sins. Now, he takes that blood. This is his offering. Every priest needs to have an offering to go into the Holy of Holies. Jesus needs something to bring with him to go into the actual Holy of Holies, heaven. All the, the tabernacle, the temple that you read in the Old Testament, they're all a copy of heaven. Ever wondered why it said 
He said to Moses, you've got to do it exactly this way. It's because it's an actual copy of what it looks like in heaven. The tabernacle and the temple were. Okay? And they're all a pre prefiguring of Jesus. They're all a prefiguring of what Jesus is going to do. Jesus, our great high priest, takes his own blood. His own blood. This is the perfect sacrifice for all time. The priests had to do it again and again and again and again, daily basis. Every year they had to go into it. Every year they had to do it again and again and again. Jesus has made the sacrifice once for us forever. Nothing else you can do. There's no other offering or sacrifice you need to make for your sins. It's been done. Jesus takes his own blood, ascends. Remember that picture of him ascending? He goes up into heaven and he comes into the holy of holies, into heaven itself. Okay? So this hope, so all of us who fled to him for refuge would, would have strong encouragement and indwelling strength to hold tightly to the hope set before us. This hope, this confident assurance, we have as an anchor of the soul. Just think about it for a minute. An anchor of the soul. Do you ever feel like your soul needs an anchor? <laughs> I certainly do. I have done this week. Oh, my goodness. And I haven't, I haven't had it because I've not gone to Jesus. But I do have it. We all have this hope. This hope. Hope is being sure of what you, faith is being sure of what you hope for. It says in the Bible, hope. If we had this hope already, it would not be hope. We hope for what we do not see, but we hope for it with absolute assurance because of what Jesus has already done. Absolute assurance because of what he's already done. Yes? And it says this hope, this confident assurance we have as an anchor of the soul, it cannot slip. And it cannot break down under whatever pressure bears upon it. A safe and steadfast hope that enters within the veil of the heavenly temple. That most holy place in which the very presence of God dwells. It comes through into the veil. A safe and steadfast hope that enters within the veil of the heavenly temple. In heaven, that most holy place in which the very presence of God dwells, where Jesus has entered in advance as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. He has become our great high priest. He has done what no other priest could do because he was God. He is God. The sac his, he lived a life completely free from sin. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Because his death on the cross would mean nothing without his life. His 33 years. Can you imagine living for 33 years without sinning? Okay, I know he was God, but he let go of his godness. I don't know how to put that very well, but he, looked, he let go of his godness as a man and he was tempted in every way as we are. And yet he resisted sin. Why was he doing all this? For us. For us, he lived a completely pure, spotless, holy life so that he could be and his blood could be an acceptable sacrifice that he could take to the father and say, I've done it. I've done it, father. It's enough. And Jesus has entered in advance ahead of us as a forerunner. It says in my notes, forerunner supposes that others will follow. He's gone ahead of us. Now, this is in my notes in the Bible, forerunner. This word was used. Now, get this. This paints a beautiful picture. I want you to just allow God to paint this picture in your mind. Forerunner. This word was used in the second century A.D., for the smaller boats sent into the harbour by larger ships 
unable to enter due to the buffeting of the weather. Can you relate to that? Can you, could you feel like that larger ship that can't enter into the harbour, the safe, calm place, due to the buffeting of the weather? So there's a smaller boat that's been sent in. These smaller boats carried the anchor of the larger boat. They carried the anchor through the breakers inside the harbour and dropped it there, securing the larger ship. Wow. And that's what Jesus has done for us. Thus, Jesus is like a runner boat that has taken our anchor into port and secured it there. Lord, thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you that our anchor is in that port because the forerunner, Jesus, like a little boat, a smaller boat, that's been able to go into that where we've not been able to, has gone in and secured our anchor already in the port. It is secure. It is there. No matter how we feel, what we're going through, even what we believe at times in our mind, where the devil and his demons lie to us, it doesn't matter because you've already gone there. And, you're, and it says in the word that God is greater than our hearts. Even how we feel, even what we think at any given time, even the most stressed we might feel, the most panicky, anything like that, it doesn't matter. As one of my friends said to me, Lord, soon after I became a Christian and I doubted even your existence, she said, well, it doesn't really matter what you think, actually, because he's just, he's still there. <laughs> that provided tremendous reassurance. Lord, we come to you today broken, pain in pain, struggling with our own things, things in our families and things are going on in the world. And Lord, we thank you that you have gone ahead of us into heaven. You've literally gone up with your resurrected body and bringing the blood, the blood of the lamb that was slain into heaven on our behalf so that we are in right relationship with you so that we can have fellowship with you so that we can can talk can be your friend you will be our friend you are our friend you are everything that we need well, words can't even express it, really. But I think you've painted, hopefully painted a picture, Lord, that we're starting to get deeper than words, deeper in our hearts of what you've done for us. And we thank you. Lord, we thank you that it says in your word that we are a kingdom and priests. And Peter says that you are a royal priesthood. And I thank you, Lord, that you've commissioned us, I believe, also to be priests in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was um, a <coughs> priest like Jesus, based not on his ancestral line as the priest of Emerald, but based on the base, his basis on the power of an indestructible life. We also have an indestructible life because we have eternal life. And Lord, you have given us to be priests now. I didn't even have time to talk about that this morning. But Lord, may you reveal to us by your spirit what that means, but us also to be priests in the order of Melchizedek, to be royal priests. We are kings or princes, princesses, kings and queens. And we have been given that priestly um authority to mediate between you and men and between men and you to help us to walk that out but lord we thank you for what you've done for us amen, amen.